Welcome, welcome, welcome. In this lecture, we're going to discuss the Hamming code. And to start you off, I have a warm up problem for you. It's called the Puzzle Mad Kidnapper problem. So, Basker Hound has kidnapped the son of a very wealthy person and has sent the following message. It says, I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 2000. If you can determine what number I'm thinking of, in 15 or fewer questions, I will release your son. Otherwise, I will kill him. I will answer each question with a yes or a no, but beware, I may lie once. Also, I will only answer your questions after you've asked all of them. Okay, so there's a number of things going on here. So we have 15 questions. We need to figure out a number between 1 and 2,000 with those 15 questions. And we have to ask all of them first. So that means that we need a non-adaptive style solution. We can't ask the first question and then change our mind afterwards. And further, it says that Basker Hound is only going to answer with a yes or a no. So that means that we have some kind of binary system to deal with this problem. In fact, we're going to learn about binary numbers to help us deal with this. So to come up with a number between 1 and 2,000 is the challenge. And you might say, well, Basker Hound is only going to lie once, and that's not too big of a deal. In a previous video, we've discussed the camper's problem and we were able to come up with, from scratch, a code that corrected two lies or two errors. So here we only need one. But the difference here is, in the campers problem, there was just three code words. There was just three things that we needed to decipher the truth about. Is it one, two, or three in terms of the path? So here, it's not just one, two, or three. It's one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 2,000. So we need to have a code that has at least 2,000 code words. So there's a lot more to decipher in terms of the options, even though there's only one lie. So I'm not going to get you to pause the video and think about this particular problem, because the solution to this problem is the Hamming code. And I certainly don't, you, don't expect you to come up with the Hamming code from scratch. Richard Hamming did, but for a mere mortal like myself, I wouldn't dream of being able to do that in a snap. This lecture is intended to build us up towards the Hamming code. There's some sub-questions here below that will eventually build us up to how to solve this problem using the Hamming code. So Richard Hamming uh, published the Hamming code in 1950. So it was probably known to Richard Hamming much before that. That's only when it was published. So a little interesting story about Hamming is he was doing a lot of this work around the time of World War II, and it made a lot of this type of work on coding theory quite secretive. And he was also employed to work on the Manhattan Project, if you don't know what that is, that's where the Americans were trying to come up with the uh, atomic bomb. So Richard Hamming was working on that. And a famous story about uh, the time when he was working on that is that his boss or employer told him to you know, check some of the calculations for this particular formula. And Richard Hamming thought to himself, well, maybe I'll, I'll get one of the... Um, you know, more lesser people to, to work on that. It's just kind of this calculation to check on. So he said, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll ask what it's for. And it was for the probability that the atomic bomb will ignite the whole atmosphere. So then Richard Hamming said, okay, I'll check it myself. Okay, from here, we're going to learn about binary numbers because that's the first step in learning about the Hamming code. So we're going to start by just doing some 
nice counting here in binary. So counting in binary, there's only two symbols to use, a zero and then a one, and then you run out of symbols. In the decimal number system, there's 10 symbols that we can use, like zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So let's count up to five in binary. So two would be just like the point when you get to, to nine in, in binary, like when we're counting the next number, it's like we've hit nine and we're going over to 10 because we run out of symbols, so we have to use two digits to represent the decimal number two as one zero in binary. So in binary, we say one zero as opposed to saying two. We don't say 10 in binary because that gets confused with the decimal number 10. So then as we count, we just increase the rightmost digit as much as possible. But now once we've hit one one, it's kind of like we've hit the number 99 in decimal because we need three digits to represent going from 1, 1 to 1, 0, 0, just like we count from 99 to 100. So then, then once we hit 5, we count 1, 0, 1. And then if we keep the counting going, we would count 1, 1, 0, so that would be 6. And then 1, 1, 1, that would be 7. Let's make a new column. So now I want to count 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 in binary. So transitioning from 1, 1, 1 to the eighth number in the binary number system, you would need four digits. So I'm going to write 1, 0, 0, 0. And then counting 9, we just increase the rightmost digit as much as possible. So next, counting 10, it would be 1, 0, 1, 0. And then 11 would be 1, 0, 1, 1. And then 12, we would count 1. And then the 1, 1 already is using the largest digit, so we'd write 1, 0, 0. And then keep counting 1, 1, 0, 1. And then 1, 1, 1, 0. And then finally 1, 1, 1, 1. So you can see that I picked sort of a natural place to stop once we've repeated back to all ones at the number 15. And also you can see that I wrote out these two columns in a, a somewhat systematic way because the counting really repeats. If you just ignore the one on the left hand side here and any of the zeros that come directly to the right hand side, you notice that the counting that's occurred here with all of these numbers is exactly the counting that's occurred there. And that makes sense. That's how we count in our regular decimal number system as well. Now, if we're counting up to large numbers, of course, this gets a bit cumbersome as the method. So luckily, there's a quick way to change back and forth from you know, decimal to binary and vice versa. So if we wanted to exchange the binary number 101010 from binary to decimal, what would we do? So let's just write that down on our page, 101010. And the formula above tells us that every uh, digit placement that's appearing in binary, if this is your binary number, it corresponds to a power of 2. So I'm just going to write those powers of 2 uh, above my number in red. So the power of 2 that the first digit placement corresponds to is 0. And then 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So what we have here, when we want to transition to the decimal number, would be 0, 2 to the power zeros, And then 1, 2 to the power 1. And then 0, 2 to the power of 2s and 1, 2 to the power 3, so 2 to the power 3, and then 0, 2 to the power 4s, and then 1, 2 to the power 5. Now this is the same way that we break up numbers in our decimal number system. It's just instead of having a, a base of 2, like we have here, it would be a base of 10 in our regular decimal number system. So here we'd have 32 plus 8 plus 2 is 42. And you could repeat this process for any size of a binary number. If it's bigger, you just have you know, larger powers of 2 to deal with. If 
the zero shows up, you don't count the power of two, and if the one shows up, you do count the power of two. Okay, let's go the other way around. What if we wanted to change one, one, one from decimal to binary? So we know that this number actually shouldn't be read as one, 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 it's from decimal, so we read this as 111. So 111, what we wanna do with this number is break it up into powers of two. So let's think of our powers of two and keep breaking this number up into those powers. So the first power of two that I can think of that's in the number 111 is 64. And what would be left over? I guess we'd have 47 left over. So we have 64 plus 47, and then we do the same thing with 47. Think of the largest power of two that's in 47, so 32. And then you'd have 15 left over. And now we can write out our number as powers of two. So 15 is eight plus four plus two plus one. So when you do this process, you wanna make sure that each power of two just appears once in this list. And then from there, every power of two that, that does appear turns into a one in binary. And every power of two that does not appear, so we have to think about, okay, which ones have we skipped? Well, we have one, doubles to two, doubles four, eight, 16. 16 is missing, so I'm gonna make sure that I put a zero in for 16. But there's no other missing powers of two, up to 64. So that's our completed binary number. So as a final wrap up to this video, what we're gonna do is solve part one of the puzzle mad kidnapper problem. So what was that? If we scroll back up, what was part one? So back to where we were, part one says, let's just assume as a starting point that Basker Hound does not lie. How could we solve the problem with 11 questions? So let you think about that, pause the video now, you have enough knowledge to do this one. Okay, so what you could have done to deal with part one here is ask Basker Hound, what is your number in binary? Now, of course, Basker Hound only answers with a yes or no. So you wouldn't be able to directly ask what your number is in binary, but you could say, what is the first digit in binary? Is it a one? Basker Hound could tell you yes or no, and so on and so on. So let's write that solution down. Okay, so we're gonna ask Basker Hound, is the first digit in binary a one? And Basker Hound might say, yes, it's a one, and then the yes will correspond to a one that we you know, record as what Basker Hound's number is. Now there's a bit of a question, what is the first one? Is it from the right-hand side of our binary digit or the left-hand side? So we should clarify Let's clarify that the first digit is the rightmost digit. So there's maybe an argument that we start with smaller digits working from the right to the left. Of course, we read from the left to the right, so there's probably an argument for going from the leftmost as, as well. But let's just stick with uh, working from the right to the left when we say first, and then the next one we'll say is the second, and again, we'll mean the second from the right, the rightmost digit. A, a one, and then so on and so on and so on. We'll keep asking these questions, dot, 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 on and on and on, until we hit question 11, and then we'll ask, is the 11th digit from the right-hand side a one? And this will you know, give us a Basker Hound's number. So if you keep going and going and asking these questions, if Basker Hound didn't lie, you would get something like, Okay, one, 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 zero, 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 on and on, on, and something like this once you got to the 11th question. So if that happened to be Basker Hound's responses, well, you'd have a, t a two to the power 10 plus a two to the power nine plus all the way down to a two to the power of two plus a two to the power one plus a two to the power zero. So all of this adds up to 1,543. So Basker Hound would be thinking of that number in the range of one to 2,000, 
And that's why we need this, this last digit. We need the 11th digit because if we didn't have that, you know, two to the power 10 here, then, you know, there wouldn't be enough to go all the way up to, you know, 2000. Um, so thanks so much for listening and we'll see you on the next one.